leading the low impact development portion of the project, and then two other members who are of our primary team who uh, are not with us this evening. One is Julie Brandt, who's a surface water specialist, and she is supporting Paul, and then the other is uh, Ben Burke, who is leading the best available science piece. Um, as this first slide uh, indicated, we're kind of early in our process and coming together with council and the public. Um, this is one of a number of opportunities that we'll be interacting with you in terms of our findings. A um, couple small things uh, that we're working through now, just so everybody knows, last week in April, we're looking at conducting our field visit and recon, so um, that's something that we're going to be using that's going to be very instrumental in terms of how this, our study coalesces. The other piece of it will be um, the information and in insight that you all have this evening that we're going to be using in terms of how that will inform our study and we move forward. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Paul. All right. Well, I think uh, to start, there's a couple of definitions that are, are going to be useful to have a little bit of understanding uh, as I go into some of these things a little bit deeper. So I'll start with the presumptive or demonstrative compliance. And what that means is, is that the way stormwater works is, is we call it presumptive compliance, which means if I have a project, if I build something and build my stormwater facility according to the way I'm supposed to in the manual, then I'm presumptively going to, uh, that means that pre we presume that I will be in compliance. I don't have any other demonstration of compliance other than I did it right in the first place. Demonstrative compliance is where I have something that's very specific that I'm going to build, and I can demonstrate and show you specifically how I'm in compliance, so that the water coming out of it has a very specific compliance measurement. The second thing I want to point out was what we call effective uh, versus total impervious surface. And the pictures are an example of what those two are. The total impervious surface is the big parking lot on the, on the uh, I guess, my right, on the right side. And that demonstrates that any water that falls on that parking lot is and goes into a storm drain is effective impervious surface. It is, it is connected to the drainage system. Where on the left, the uh, trail kind of demonstrates ineffective uh, impervious surface. It may be an impervious surface, but when water runs and falls on it and runs off, goes in the grass, infiltrates, and so on, it's not connected to a drainage system, so it's not effective impervious surface. So the difference between effective and total impervious surface matters in the things we're going to talk about. The next thing is, is what is a forest to what's forested? So is a forest a tree or is it uh, like above? Uh, is it a forest really a, co a collection of things that include trees and soil and an understory and an overstory? What, what, what is a forest? And uh, another part about the forest that matters is it intact. So it isn't a, one tree, another tree, another tree. It's a, uh, how big a collection of trees you need in one place to be considered something that would perform or behave as a forest. And when I talk about these things, everything is in the context of hydrology. And hydrology is the science of rain falls out of the sky and all the water goes somewhere. It goes into the ground, it runs off into the streams, it evaporates back in the air. The next thing is what is low impact development, or LID. This is a different type of LID than what we were talking about earlier. But low impact development is basically a set of measures, or suite of measures, that are intended to control stormwater very close to the source where they're generated. So we try to put things near where the pavement is. We try to collect stormwater and not just uh, have it run off instead of going into the ground, or we try to reintroduce it into the ground. There's a lot of things that, are, that are, have been or can be included in what is low impact design or LID. So there's a couple of uh, important understandings or things to understand about, what, about LID and what it's intended to do. And this is a quote from the phase one permit. The phase one permit is a permit that all the large communities have. They, uh, the small communities like Bothell, who's a phase two community, has the same definitions and so on. But I want to point out the things that are said in orange, and that is, is that uh, LID and uh, application of LID is intended to mimic pre-disturbance hydrologic processes of an infiltration, filtration, storage, evaporation, and transpiration. So the idea is, is that uh, a LID system is supposed to make the land respond to rainfall as if it were a forest. 
So there's another distinction, and that is, is what is an LID best management practice? So I should say what a best management practice is, is that a series of measures like stormwater ponds and detention facilities and swales that are things that stormwater scientists and stormwater engineers apply to sites in order to control stormwater. They're called best management practices. So when we talk about an LID best management practice, it's one of those practices that is that performs in the way that LID works, mainly, as I show in orange again, and emphasize pre-disturbing hydrologic processes. The idea is we're trying to mimic how the land responds to rainfall if it were undisturbed, if it were still a forest. So the next thing and the last thing I want to define are, L, uh, the, are what are included in LIDBMPs. And this matters because depending where you are in the country, even what city you are in Puget Sound, there are different definitions of what is included in LID and what's not included. And here's a list of the kinds of things that are included. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. So we're talking about what is the best available science in watershed planning. And I, if you're familiar with this, uh, with this project at all, you'll understand what a lot of these numbers mean. But I'll try to go through them real briefly, but at least th completely enough so that everyone can understand what we mean. <laughs> And these are the results of a number of different either studies that have been done or that are commonly understood in the Puget Sound area in the western Washington or things that are still go ongoing that are explaining what is the effect of development on watersheds and what's the effect of development on streams. So the first one is the 1065 guideline, which is something King County has used. And that is, refers to ten, uh, a watershed that is 10% impervious and 65% forest is considered to be uh, still potentially reasonably healthy watershed. The streams within that watershed are considered healthy. And the, so they use that as a, as a land use guideline. The next one, 1015.75, refers to 10% impervious, 15% grass, and 75% forest. And these are the standards of the, the conditions in the watershed that were included in the Des Moines Creek Basin Plan, which is one of the few, if only, basin plans that are approved by, have been approved by ecology. And the third one is called the 8% target, which was done by one, in Juanita Creek by King County and Kirkland. And that refers to uh, their evaluation of just trying to establish an appropriate uh, hydrologic regime or hydrology in a, in a basin in order to maintain a targeted need or a targeted desire. So I'll, I want to go back through and note, and you'll notice that each one of these was uh, in that in the uh, subheading below each of the three things I talked about. That describes how those things were developed, and they were all developed using different approaches. They all arrived at using different considerations and different things. So the 1065 was based on it looked at a bunch of watersheds that were already developed and said well, what's the point at which a watershed's considered degraded? And they said, well, if it's more than 10% impervious or more than 65% of the forest is disturbed, it tends to be degraded. 101575 in Des Moines Creek was based on, we looked at the stream and said, what, what makes an unstable stream? And we said that if we have a uh, development in a watershed that meets the 101575, it's a stable stream. If it's more than that, more developed than that, it is not a stable stream. The 8% target is relating as a, a new thing, a fairly new thing that's relating the amount of development that's occurred in a watershed related to a specific stream health metric. And the specific stream health metric is, frankly, it's a bug. It's bugs, a collection of bugs. And the idea is, is that if a stream changes enough, the bugs will be affected and it will be considered biologically an unhealthy stream. So there's a, the next thing I point out is the LID manual adoption and the MPDS permit. And what, that, what those are, you remember I mentioned presumption, and that is, is that if I, apply, if I have a manual and I apply a manual to a development site, I can be considered to be in compliance. So ecology considers that the adoption of an LID manual and, and their stormwater manual and their NPDES permit, the permit that the city holds, that if they're following those, they are presumptively complying with stormwater management, and that is considered, uh, I'm, I'm transferring the words, it's considered best available science, but in the stormwater world, we use different words. We use a word called ACART, which is all known available reasonable technology, 
or we use a term called maximum extent practicable, or we, we use a term reasonable, uh, reasonable assurance. So there's different terms, and they all kind of mean about the same thing as best available science. But anyway, that is the way stormwater managers apply uh, their standards to development to, in order to be in compliance. There's a couple other things that are going on right now. One of the things is called Building Cities in the Rain, which is a pro program the mayor is very familiar with. And it has to do with uh, the Department of Commerce evaluating the potential conflict between growth management and stormwater standards. The idea that maybe the two applied together don't necessarily fit very well. So there is still work going on. They're still doing some studies. And the last thing I want to point out is, is that the NPDES permits are requiring the Phase One communities, and the Phase One communities are Seattle, Tacoma, Snohomish County, King County, Pierce County, and Clark County. They are all required to be doing watershed planning, which is continuing to get at this question about what kind of hydrologic effects are negative and what kind of hydrologic, uh, hydrologic effects should we control development to. <coughs> So I wanted to go in a little bit more detail because this really starts to get into, uh, and I'm not going to kill you with trying to explain what this chart means, but the, the idea is, is that this is really what's getting at where is the science on low impact design and its effect on watersheds. And I would just point out a couple of things on this chart. So if you start on the top of the chart, you go down to the red, second red line that says ECY 8%. That's what's called an ecology 8% standard. It doesn't matter what that means. It just means that that is the performance measurement that low impact design is expected to provide. And it's a very high standard. So this bar chart is representing what are called BIBI scores, which are, uh, again, that's bug counts. Um, but the idea, and, but it represents stream health. So the higher you are in the chart, the more healthy the stream is. The lower you are in the chart, the unhealthier the stream is. So the idea is, is that you can see, since a forested, of course, you would expect to be the highest health because it's unaffected. The next standard is the ecology standard for uh, low impact design, and that is still considered reasonably healthy stream. As you continue down the chart, you see where the 6510 rule falls in, in, in as far as stream health. And then you also see LID 80%. Those are really important to understand and the next thing I'm going to talk about, and that is, is saying that they are still in the reasonable middle, middle and healthy range of a stream, but they are uh, not the same as the Ecology ECY8, and they are reasonably around the LID 80% standard, which I'll explain in a little bit. I, I'm not going to uh, spend time to talk about a little bit more of, of the words on the other side, but just kind of following the ideas is that hydrology, as it's connected to stream health with LID standard, tends to be good. Uh, 6510 tends to be good. Other standards tend to be not so good. So the real question that we're asking here is, is that is LID equivalent to a forest? And remember earlier on we were talking about uh, the idea that the intent of LID is to mimic forest uh, hydrologic processes. So the question is, is that do LI, how, how, not so much how well do they do, but is that a reasonable consideration to make that LID and forests perform about the same hydrologically? So, the, and the things that are, it's performing, meaning like does it infiltrate, does a LID infiltrate like a forest? Does it intercept water like a forest? Does the runoff from the site, is it equivalent to the way a forest performs? So this is the question that we're really asking as far as best available science in this area, is, is that what's the equivalence, relative equivalence between forest retention and the application of low impact design? So the short answer is it depends. So I, uh, there are certain LID um, measures like bioretention, which is basically small areas where you push, put water into and they infiltrate into the ground and they don't have any discharge or have minimal discharge. Rain gardens are kind of the same thing, just generally a kind of semantic and maybe a different set of, uh, sense of scale. Um, dispersion is another thing, and that is when, if you remember back to the picture I showed of the trail, water runs off the trail, goes into the grass, it doesn't run off, it doesn't collect, that's dispersion. All those LID measures are, can be reasonably expected to be equivalent in performance hydrologically to a forest. You can uh, argue a lot of detail around that and so on, but the concepts are 
that, that I've kind of tried to create a pathway to showing how there's a, uh, uh, an understanding, a recognition in the field that LID is equivalent to, hydrologically is equivalent to a forest. And we're just talking about hydrology. There are a number of other LID measures that were on the list that I showed you that I would say are not necessarily equivalent to a forest. Permeable pavements, downspout controls, soil quality, vegetated roofs, water reuse. So I was debating and, and under, helping it, you know, as we walk through this, this is, we're almost to the last slide here, this is trying to say, well, I talked about a lot of basic concepts, but then how does this translate into something you apply day to day? How does this really go in ahead and how do you apply it into the Fitzgerald area? And this is where I think I should probably stop. Uh, because this is, this is there's a, um, I could explain uh, kind of what this means, but this is kind of the, this, these are the steps and the concepts, I think the working concepts that we'll be going through to sh demonstrate how the idea of LID is equivalent to forest, what kind of LID is equivalent to forest, what does equivalence to forest mean, what guideline to use, what's an appropriate uh, guideline to establish, to apply standards to. This is sort of the process that we would intend to go through. So that's all I uh, all I've, was intending to uh, talk about. I can answer questions, so I hope. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, do we have questions from council members? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like going first, though. <laughs> oh, here we go. There was our brave one. Can you put up the slide where it has the little bar graph? Yeah. So you said that. Um, LID is equivalent to a forest in those three examples. But when I look at your, your graph, LID 80%, that line is well below forest and ecology 8%, whatever that is. So okay. how is it that those two lines don't, aren't on top of each other but are considered equivalent, the, the, the two are considered equivalent? So um, it's a good question. So the ecology, 8%, is actually the way that um, if you to, were to carefully evaluate how an LID system works, it is really working within a, with a performance measure, which is that ecology 8%. And what, it, what the ecology 8% means is, is that it's basically the same volume of water that's leaving a site uh, before development leaves the site after development. And there's a, and there's a point in the hydrology where it's, it's the the eight, basically 8% eight of the water is, um, it's, a, it's a cutoff point, it's a, a modeling exercise. So the ecology 8% is actually representing the LID um, hydrologic performance. The LID 80% was a, a measure that was, uh, um, I'll go back here. The late eight, LID 80% was something that was done in the Winita Creek plan that said only 80% of the watershed was going to be retrofit with LID. So it meant that 20% was not going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's, um, again, it's on here, is, is that the LID 80% is not 100% LID of all the development in the Juanita Creek watershed, which is why it's lower than that. The ecology 8% is considered to be, if you can't do LID and you have to, you're supposed to do it, meet an LID performance, you have to meet the 8% standard. So that's where the equivalence comes between LID and the 8% standard. Yep, that help? A little bit. So that LID 80% line, which is far below the forested, really refers to, you said the Juanita Creek watershed, where only 80% of the development was going to be assumed to be retrofitted to LID standards? Yes. So 20% of that watershed would remain unretrofitted? Yes. And so even with, um, with just 20% unretrofitted remaining, you get a pretty significant drop from the forested condition. I wouldn't apply too much significance to the, oh, the, okay. the absolute okay. of the numbers, but they are different. I mean, it does, it, it's, it is a, um, a subjective measure as far as high quality, medium quality, low quality. It is different. Okay. So it's not, you, don't, you shouldn't interpret it as a linear scale necessarily. Um, it is linear in the numbers that are provided, but not necessarily limited, lin, uh, linear in the what's representing. It may not be a linear graph. Gotcha. Um, 
And then what you're talking about in terms of um, low impact development is not just in application to the Fitzgerald area. This is what we're applying citywide. Is that correct? Aren't we doing that as a part of our our required um, LID implementation? So you will be you right now. You're in a process where you are removing barriers to low impact design in your mm -hmm. codes, and they have to be adopted by the end of the year. So and then um, I don't know where you are in the rest of your application of you know like where you are in your manual and adoption and manual and so on to uh, specifically require so right now you're required to use LID where feasible the next thing is remove the barriers to applying LID and the next step will be to LID will be part of your stormwater manual and then can you put the last slide up please mm -hmm. uh, this one yes so you said you didn't I, I'm trying to make that leap of you know how you've provided these definitions and these standards. I'm trying to make that leap to um, what that's going to look like in the Fitzgerald area. And I see your slide here. Mm -hmm. So um, so am I to look at that and, and, and conclude that what you're what you're moving towards, or maybe you're not moving towards anything, is when it says LI LID total and purpose area to 10% allowable and 35%. Yeah. What does that mean? So what that means is is that um, if the if the 1065 guideline is, is the one that's chosen, that means you do get to have 10% impervious surface. So that's the way that it's been modeled and where the hydrology works. So that would be 10% 10, 10 effective impervious area. So what that means is is that uh, what LID really does is it turns total impervious area in some into ineffective impervious area. So which, but it, in because of the 10% part of it, you don't have to turn all of it into ineffective impervious. So like if you have 40% 40, 40 impervious and you can LID 30% of it away and leave 10, um, it, then make 30% ineffective, then you're still re meeting the 10% allowable or the 10% acceptable. So the idea is, is that take the, total impervious area and reduce it to 10% in the 35%. But then the other part in the 65%, we have to reduce it to zero, basically. We have to make them completely equivalent. And question for staff, um, that seems different than what is, which was in the ordinance that was um, um, ruled um, Ruled well, incorrect or whatever. What am I going to say? For the by the Growth Management Hearings Board, that well, that seems different than ordinance. What the old ordinance twenty one sixty three? Yeah, it was different in twenty one sixty three. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was different in twenty one sixty three, and basically what we've done is we've reverted back to eighteen. No, I'm sorry, nineteen eighty eight which is a little bit different in and of itself, too. So this is kind of a new approach that we're going to be looking at. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Okay, I'll go. Um, do we have the bug scores or the benthic index scores for the two creeks that go through this sub area? Have you guys looked at those? I have not. Okay. Do we have scores for them, Steph? You know, we'll have... We'll have to look at that. I know that uh, Ben Burke, the primary biologist, wasn't able to be here tonight. And I know he's got a bunch of that kind of data, so that'll okay. be one of the things we're going to be adding to this information if we have it. Okay. So we might have them as over the years, but we don't know for sure. Uh, for we may we may have it. We probably don't have measurements over the years. We probably have one or two spot areas. Okay. Um, so just for a little background, I don't know. I'm sure you've discuss this with staff, but one of the things that the, the issue really with, with this area, at least one of them, is that we've had this low impact development overlay. And it was a special overlay over just this part of our city and it was unlike any other in the region. And what it's caused is basically uh, an inability for, for potential developers to look at the land. These are all developable properties basically. I mean, there's critical areas on them and everything else, but that aside, um, they're developable. And the LID overlay has been um, really hard to predict 
what they're getting into, if they're going to make a profit, if they can get, build enough houses, that type of thing. So d am I understanding correctly that you guys are looking to do another LID overlay that's, that's unique to this part of the city with this study? Or are you guys looking to potentially at the, the citywide low impact development requirements and seeing if that is sufficient to make these uh, streams healthy while it's developable? I would, I would say right now it would be the latter, and that is, is, is that um, application of LID, while maybe narrow, more narrowly defined, to make sure that there's an equivalence that the L application of the LID is equivalent to the forest. And so it's not any different than you would be applying anywhere else in the city. Okay. Just more, more narrowed, focused. So my next question is, do we know about the soils, or is that the, the guy that's not here that has the information on the soils in this area? No, they... I, that, would, that would be part of what we'll be, would, would be involved in, whether or not one could do that. We have some preliminary geotechnical information, but it's not you know, um, comprehensive of the whole area. So I think that's something that we're going to be looking into deeper as well. You know, um, What's it looking like from what you've seen, or, or do you not know? I mean, you have some, but have you guys looked at it? You know what I, the soils are like. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I think the way I think you know that is uh, one of the important parts of the detail in here is is that, and it, it probably leads to the same question that you're that you've had before, and that is is that what amount of area do you need to to LID or to have for LID in order to make the development get down to zero? So, meaning that if you have poor soils you would need to have, uh, either have less impervious area to infiltrate into it or change the amount of, uh, or, or add to the area that you need to infiltrate. I think I just said the same thing twice, but basically the, um, the, that, that, that idea is, is that um, you, you can't do 64% of the 65% in LID at all in 1%. And so that, that the percentage of land that you need in order to LID will vary a lot based on the soils. So that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is, okay. is that it's hard to make that, that um, have that deeper understanding about that in this specific area yet. Okay. Because for, for me, at least, when it comes to the, because we have two options for the, the citywide low impact development requirements, it's the, the list or using the performance standard, which is a range of storm events from 8% of the two-year through half the two-year, which I'm sure that everybody understands what that means. Mm -hmm. but, um, but he said 8%. Right, eight percent. There we go. I should have just said eight percent. Um, if we just required that in this area, is that something you're looking at and saying you don't do the list approach in this area? You just have to model and demonstrate that you're meeting the eight percent through the fifty-year storm event. Well, that's why I brought up presumption versus demo dem demonstrative. Is is that the idea? Is is that I think ideally because stormwater actually I think works the best if you're in a in, stay in a presumptive area in a presumptive state is is that it would be presumptive meaning that you'll apply the LID and we'll assume that it'll work that it'll you'll presume that it'll work. Um, I think uh, I I would suggest that um, there's it's probably as hard to predict what the eight percent would do as it would be like uh, how feasible the uh, LID is in, uh, across, the, across the area, across the basin. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that I, would, I, I think this is going to go down the line of being presumptive and that it would not be, uh, we would not be expecting to demonstrate the 8%. Yeah, because the city would have to demonstrate. I mean, we wouldn't hold the developer accountable and have them come back and re-engineer, retrofit the development they built, it would be the city that would have to go back if we went demonstrative or demonstrative. Yeah. But I, I think that if the, I, I mean, just like the reason the 8% is there is, is that if for some reason there's some issues around LID or that the developer needs another approach, their way to demonstrate how LID should be performing is to use the 8%. So that the idea is, is that if they can't make the other part work, then as long as they can make the 8% work, they can develop it. Okay. Um, have you guys looked at the zoning, changing the zoning in your, I guess let me take one step back. Are you guys going to do scenarios with modeling? Was not, we're, I, we were not planning to. Okay. Because um, one of the things about the, the, we had an ordinance that was uh, contested and it was repealed 
um, is it, and I think the the rub is that we had we had a road that provided transportation through this area um, and also impacted property owners. <clears throat> we also have environmentally uh, important habitat and and, and uh, sensitive areas in this area. Um, and to accommodate that road going through there, we raised the uh, zoning in this area um, to compensate for the, 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 the road being taken out and then having the LID overlay. And so it went to from uh, R40,000 to 5400A, I think it is. Is it A? OK. And because we have different zones in this area, and, and the, the real the part that people are upset about is, is they're, it's called zone one, which is kind of the eastern border of it. it's up on the hillside. Um, and that's kind of one of my questions too, is are you guys looking at different zones or is it, are you looking at the whole Fitzgerald area as uh, one study area? Are we bringing back the zones, Mr. Blackburn? Well, I guess I would pose that question to the council. Um, I was not sure that that was an approach we were gonna take. Is that something the council is looking at? Uh, asking I, us to investigate? I mean, I can speak for myself. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people in this area and the people that want zone, or they don't want probably the zoning change, but they want the LID overlay to go away is the, what was referred to as zone one, which is the east side of it. And I've heard actually equal amount of people, believe it or not, from the other parts of the area that don't want anything to go away. They like it the way it is. They don't want it to develop. They're more than happy with it, with the restrictive uh, development regulations, basically. So. Um, maybe that'll help us get out of this uh, situation is if we actually don't take it as one big study area, but we look at the, we bring back the zones from whatever study it was that zones were involved because it's not in our code. Um, right. and, to, and to me, it seems like in that, in that area, the, the, our, the area that zone one, which is now zone 5400A, we don't have transportation to get people in and out of there at that density. So I, I would encourage you guys to look at different zoning for that area. If it's because it doesn't make sense to me that we would have 5400 a take out all the LID regulations and the transportation out of the area. And that's part of why I didn't support the ordinance when it came forward the first time that then fell apart at the state hearing board. So 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 may, may I ask a follow up question? Oh, please? yeah, uh, thank you. So the idea was you would be changing the zoning by making it less dense. Is that kind of what your yeah. thought process? Okay. Yeah, because okay. I, I think you can accommodate low impact development. You can meet the LID performance standard if you had a lower zoning for zone one. And it would only be zone one. You the the eastern part of the area you'd want to change. You wouldn't want to change because to the west it's you've got an R forty thousand designation between North Creek and thirty fifth Avenue, and then it goes ninety six hundred between thirty fifth Avenue and approximately thirty ninth Avenue. Right. So that would, I, I'm sorry, we, we can talk about this more later. Yeah, I, I just, I've heard from the people in the other zones other than the R5400A that they right. don't want anything to change. Okay, I haven't heard enough. one person out of, I mean, hopefully they come forward now, but I haven't heard anybody outside of that zone one that wants anything to change with the code. Okay. And that, that I, don't, okay. I don't agree with keeping it a special LID overlay for this area of the city versus the other parts of the city. I think that's what's, that's the crux of the issue with, with the property owners that we've you know, we've, we've been told that we've had a, um, a moratorium, basically zoning moratorium in, in a sense, because people can't figure out how much their, our developers can't figure out if it'll pencil for them to develop the land. So, um, and it only applies to this one portion of the, the entire area. Yeah, that's okay. correct, yes, okay. yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So you mentioned forest area. So in our, in our code, we have a percentage forest area. Um, are you going to look at the areas that are forested now? Because that was one of the things about the LID overlay, that if you had a property that, let's say, it only had 10% forest now, we had to bring it up to and like literally plant hundreds of trees on your property to have the percentage of forest based on the zoning. Um, are you guys looking at the forest there now and trying to give us an assessment of like what, because we don't really even know what's there now. So there, I flipped up another slide that it really kind of gets at some of those questions that you've just been asking. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> and, um, and one of them is, is that what's the current condition of the watershed and are the percentages applied to the watershed? So that I was talking about in terms of the watershed, but the other one is, is that looking at the question of if we're talking about 65% and right now it's only 10%, then how do we resolve that? Or how do we approach that issue 
in the standards in this watershed. So that's, those are questions that we're still, still working on. And the other is, um, are things like uh, development transfers and, um, and then you're, you were asking the question about, well, they upzoned it and then they figured out maybe they couldn't do that anyway. And that last question is, can LID match the density? So no. you you we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, you have identified a bunch of the questions that we're we're kind of uh, we know that are going to be next part of what we're going to be working on. So. And so, as part of this discussion, this is probably for you, Bruce. Are we going to discuss the um, facilitated discussion? Is that part of this presentation? Or did you guys just want to talk about the best available science? Yeah, the idea was to kind of talk about best available science and get some input from the uh, council on some of the things. And actually, we've heard quite a few pretty interesting things here, so okay. I'm happy that uh, we can talk about the, the process if you'd like to. We can update you if you'd like. Well, I'm going to do my last bomb, and then I'll hand over the microphone. And that's that we've gotten a lot of feedback from people that some people shouldn't be invited, and I don't want so-and-so to be there, and I think so-and-so should be there, and stuff like that. And, you know, to be honest with you, it's a $15,000 expense to the city that we added to try to make it more of a, uh, a process where people could come to, to truce with each other. And we can't, I don't know if we can get people to the table together. So I, I, I'm not overly enthusiastic about the responses that I have heard from the public about doing the facilitated process. And to me, it's, it's like, fine, then we'll just make the decision. And this is the bomb. The decision, in my mind, without the science, would be 9,600 with the LID performance, LID performance standard. Done. And let's let the fur fly. So I'll hand it over after that to somebody else. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> if I had to make the decision on my own, so. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> can LED match density? Um, can, can we do transfers? It's these questions here that we're working on next. What's your feeling? Uh, I don't know if I can ask this question. What's your feeling on the uh, potential success of facilitation? I'm going to let Tom answer that one. <laughs> well, I. I <clears throat> I think we're, we're seeking your direction on facilitation. We, <clears throat> we're ready, we're re ready to write a contract for a facilitator and begin that process. So if you want to stop it, this is, this is the time to do it. Uh, if you want us to go ahead, we're, we're ready and set, ready to go ahead with it. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's going to produce valuable information, um, but but it's really city council that needs to weigh in on whether that information is going to be useful in your decision-making process. Uh, I'm willing to support the mayor. I, the only question that I have is, is 9,600 lifting that with the LID lifted? Is that what you said? Well, it's, so the LID performance standard is a it's a it's a technique you use to design your stormwater system, and um, it is it is very restrictive if there's not good soils. So that's why I asked that. Um, it work if the soils are okay, but if if the soils aren't okay, then your development potential would be significantly impacted. So that's why the study for me that's the study. Like can can we just make this area have the same LID requirements as there typically are in, in the Puget Sound area? And can we do that um, and still have healthy streams? And Because we do have two really healthy streams. That's why I wanted the BIBI scores. I've looked at the data set. They didn't have BIBI, but we have a surface water report out there that staff have produced, and those are their best and healthiest streams in this entire city. So uh, it's not something I take lightly to say, oh, yeah, go ahead and develop it. And, take the protections off and kill the last two streams because then we'll be going back there 20 years from now and trying to fix them. So, sorry, did I answer your uh, question? Yeah, no, I, well, so I guess, uh, I guess I just would want to know what the impact of, of what you're suggesting would have on the health of the area. And if, it, and if we can separate out zone one, what that impact would be as well. Well, the short answer on the storm, on the stormwater side, on the LID side, is is that with the eight percent standard, it it it, I think that's an effective standard, and it's a very difficult standard to meet, and so that'll translate back into how developable a piece of land is. 
So meaning that more and more and more of the land would become part of the stormwater management system and less developed. So there's an intersection point between what, you know, the, how much you can develop and then how much land you need for stormwater if you have really poor, poor soils. So that, that, so that still kind of the, raised the question of is there any, any is it raising, um, raising that, lifting that curtain, I guess, of uncertainty around development on there? So uh, clarifying question, uh, my understanding is that we have to have LID across the whole city at this point anyway. So we can't really lift that off of that area anyway, correct? Um, That's so correct. the LID, LID is what it is everywhere. Yes. I mean, it should be by the end of this year. That's right. Well, uh, yes and <laughs> yes and. So it's, it, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to help out a little bit here. It, it's, it's incorrect. So the LID overlay we have there now has nothing to do with the LID requirements and regulations that are coming down the line at the end of this year. Okay. So it's totally different. Okay. okay. That being said, if we lift the old LID, the new LID will still apply. Yes. Okay. So I guess I, the only question I have is, is 9,600 going to um, meet that standard? Uh, uh, will that suffice uh, to meet the, L, the new LID standard? Um, it's what what it translates back into is is that the standard is the standard, and so mm -hmm. that the whoever's designing and developing it has to figure out oh, how to meet the standard. Oh, they have to figure it. So it's not your problem. <laughs> no, and, and it's it's more that the idea is it just it, that that establishes whatever the standard is. So no matter how much development is, that standard is what ultimately will. And, and their ability to meet the standards is what matters. So the standards the same no matter what the amount of development okay. is. Um, so I guess you know I've had the same I've heard the same comments from one side that they're not interested in in being uh, in a facilitation with another um, another member. And uh, you know if if they can't play nice and talk together, then I'm I don't feel like wasting fifteen thousand um, dollars. We can give it to the fire department. Yeah, my heart is about to jump out of my stomach. It's pumping so hard I can't believe it. The 180% reversal the two of you just done is unfathomable. My issue is, as you sit up here, you're supposed to stay by your word. And I heard you say to the very people that are sitting here that are listening to their property values continue to be taken away for years on end that you would be willing to work together. And now based upon one comment, you want to take back your word. That is unfathomable, literally. I wish somebody could take my pulse. Maybe the two of you can. This is private property. This is people's livelihoods we're talking about here. It's a big deal. And to put out there that at the beginning, the first vote that you took under the guidance of one of your political contributors to reverse, I'm not out of order. You don't need to bring in political your decision process has been highly impacted by that. That's your assumption. You're out of order. That's Do you not assumption. speak to that? You can't presume that another council member Are we just having a free talk now? No, we're not. Okay, good. So. You're getting out of order. I think out of order is when you say that we're going to have a facilitated discussion and then because somebody sends an email saying they want to have a different way that things are talked about because somebody appealed their decision or the decision that you're now going to take that opportunity away is highly un un unfortunate. My hope is you as the mayor and taking some leadership opportunity to say, you know what, there's a lot of passion on both sides, there's disagreement, but I think that we can bring people together. That's what I hope you would do right now. That's your opportunity to say, you know what, there's passions on both sides, understand both sides, may not want to talk to each other, but let's have a facilitator come in and work together. For us to just take this back into our own hands, I think is completely different than Councilmember Sandberg. I appreciated where you were at the beginning of the year, and I hope you're still there today, that you're willing to work with the people that are sitting back here and the promises that you made. I am holding to your words. And um, so my passion and my call is to you to stand by that, and I hope that you will. So. I appreciate you bringing some information forward here. A lot of history goes 10 years of working with the, these property owners. And so I'm hoping that with this best, best available science, you can help with a facilitator to bring us together to a reasonable solution. Anyone else? Go for it. Um, 
it's wow. If we had not withdrawn our appeal, we'd probably have a decision by now, and we wouldn't need a facilitator, and it would just be a fact. And um, the and that was a hundred thousand dollars wasted. The and now we're debating whether we want to spend. You know, it's brought up. Well, maybe I don't want to spend fifteen an additional fifteen thousand um, dollars. We made a promise to go through this process to get the best available science done, to have a facilitator for these people, and, um, and dang it, we got, we got to be you know, individuals of our word. We promised these people we'd do that. That's up to us to, hold, to be accountable for what we said we would do. So we're, we're going to go through this process. We're going to get the best available science. And we're, we're going to have a facilitated process. And we're going to come to a middle ground. Because we told both sides that's what we were going to do. It, um, it's the right thing. And it's the responsible thing. Because I think in the long run, this process, we haven't been responsible to this process. We wasted a hundred thousand dollars and got nothing for it. Shame on us. I don't know, uh, Director Leonhardt. Hundred thousand dollars fill a lot of potholes, wouldn't it? We'll never fill a pothole with it. I want. I hope that um, you gentlemen, your your company, will have an emphasis on the Zone One of the Fitzgerald sub area. There. They're they're the they're the people that are you know we're we're trying to work with, it's it's those folks. Um, I I want an emphasis up there, and for those that don't want change, I'm willing to not give them change, but there's people up there that want change, and so let's look look at that. They've been the most impacted through this whole process because of um, potential roadway. Uh, going through, and then the the LID that we put on there, more restrictive than any other place in the city, um, as it's been termed, an experiment that didn't work well, and we tried to right the wrong and had an appeal, and we never followed through on uh, an appeal to the Growth Management Hearings Board, and uh, we appealed that decision, and we never got to find out whether we were doing the right thing or not. So. Um, I want to, and we need to, to be uh, individuals of our word, follow through with what we said we would do. And, uh, and that is continue on with the study, have the uh, mediated process, the facilitated process, to come to reasonable ground that is um, uh, accepted by both sides. And typically, in my experience, when nobody's happy, it's probably the middle ground. Because when, it, when nobody gets everything they want, it's probably the middle ground. They, get, they win some and they lose some. Uh, and, and that's probably where we're gonna be here. But gosh dang it, we, we gave our word and we, as a council, we better stand up and uh, keep our word. It's not emotional, is it? Not much. I think, I think the people that live in Zone 1 uh, have been putting up with something that may be wrong, may be right. We'll never know till we get all the data. Uh, but I think it is up to us to get the information, to look at the information, compile the information, to ask if everybody wants to get together and talk about it. If, if one side doesn't show up, so be it, one side doesn't show up. That will tell me a lot. I don't care what your political affiliations are. We're here for those people out there. That should be one of our goals. We're here for those people. We're here to try to make Bothell a better place. We're here not to destroy two streams. That's gonna be kinda tough, isn't it? But I think all the data that's going to be compiled will give us a lot of the information that we need to make a good decision. I think we need to emphasize zone one in this study. 
and take a look specifically at that data because that'll tell us a lot. But I think we need to move forward. I think we need to move forward for the citizens and we need to move forward for us as a city. Passion, wow. Well, um, I came to this study session and thank you for your presentation, by the way. But I came here to learn some more information that I didn't already know. Which you guys educated us a little bit on the processes on how you come up with stuff. But I'm looking at a schedule in our agenda packet that quite frankly doesn't get us anywhere until October or November for any decisions to be made. So, so to me, I'm a little frustrated that it's taking so long that we don't have more than what we learned today. And that's not your fault. I'm just saying, I want information. I want to obtain this information so that when I'm talking to people, I have an understanding of what's actually out there and what we can and cannot do. Um, I understand Council Member Freed's passion about um, getting together, not getting together, Council Member Spivey, but the bottom line for, for, for me as a council member is, I did tell the people I did make a promise to do something and I want to be able to do it. But I don't have any information today that I couldn't have went and looked up myself. So I need information. I want to help people get to the end result. But the only way to do that is to have information. And I don't, I don't have anything today further than what I could have had. So thank you. So um, I'm looking at the schedule. And um, I appreciate staff putting together a really detailed schedule. I think there's a lot of information there, a lot of um, steps that um, I would like us to see, I would like to see us complete. Um, and I'm, I'm not really sure when people say they wanna see special emphasis on zone one. Um, I mean, when we talk about a watershed, every part of the watershed impacts the quality of, of the stream. So I don't know what it means to give special emphasis, for example, on so, zone one. So I think we should be looking at it, at the approach, um, the watershed approach that, that I thought we were doing. Um, I, I would like us to do the, um, the engagement process and like you said, if people want to come, they can come. And if they don't want to come, then their voices aren't heard at that level. And that would be unfortunate. Um, I'm really looking forward to the best available science, because I think that's what we were originally coming into this process, is saying, OK, this, there was a decision made that we were going to let best available science um, guide the process. So that decision was made, and I think we need to um, be consistent with that. And when I look at the schedule, um, we will come to a decision. If we stay on track, we will come to a decision about um, any code changes for the Fitzgerald area in July, so before our August break. So they will have, the, the property owners in that area, if we follow this schedule, will have certainty um, presuming that nothing gets appealed. They, and the whole process of the, um, the, the discussion process ahead of time is to make sure that we get to a product that, that will withstand appeal. But we, they will have certainty in, in July, and that's what I'm aiming for. Um, and I, I, think, I, think, I think we can do this. And um, so that's, I'm going to support this process. And yes, there is an October and November final action date, but that's when we adopt all of the comp comprehensive plan changes for the year. And so I think if we, if we dedicate ourselves and make sure that we don't extend beyond July 26, if that means extra meetings, then I think that we can stay true to the promises we've made and give them some certainty in a reasonable amount of time. Does anybody else want to do a second round, or are we good? We good? OK. Do you feel like you got what you needed? 
Actually, more. Actually, well, yeah, more too. But I, I think actually this was really informative for all of us here. Um, and we got some pretty good data we're going to go back and start pulling out and getting together for the facilitated process, which still appears to be on. And uh, that'll be a really important process from our standpoint because that'll be where we try and integrate the science with the public policy, with the land use codes and things like that, uh, which is always a very interesting and complex process, to, to say the least. Uh, so thank you very much. Do you, anybody have anything more to add up here? So I do have just one last thing to add to this conversation is that uh, bringing up not doing the facilitated process was not because I didn't want to, we didn't want to hold up to our word. Um, it was just in response to um, the property owners actually out there not being interested in having people come to the table as envisioned by the council. So I'm perfectly happy with the visioning process moving forward. Uh, with that, we'll move into AB 16-064, study session to discuss development services, cost of service, and fee study. And we'll have Mike Delac, our Deputy Director, Community Development Director. Oh, and Peter Moy, FCS Group. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of the council. So we're here tonight uh, with Peter Moy from the FCS group to bring forward a, a, about a two-year culmination of a process that we started. Uh, in October of 2013, we, we used the Lattimore group to do a series of uh, focus groups with our development services cu customers. And uh, they made a host of recommendations for improvements and one of those was to convert from the hourly billing fee to a flat fee. Uh, and the reason they cited was it brought a known to the development application process. They knew going in what kind of fees they'd be paying to go through their land use entitlements all the way through the construction uh, as well. So we started looking at it internally. Uh, we had just, unfortunately, we had just transitioned to the Intergov uh, permit tracking software system. and so. The, the data from the old system was no longer being supported. The data in the new system, there wasn't a whole lot to, to glean from it. Uh, we qu quickly realized within a matter of a few months that we really needed someone with more expertise that uh, specialized in, in fees and rate studies and uh, could pull information from surrounding jurisdictions, et cetera, to help us. So we brought uh, the FCS group in in June of 2014. And staff has been working with Peter and his group uh, ever since. And so tonight, Peter's going to bring forward his uh, of uh, his findings and present those for your consideration. <coughs> Thank you, Mike. So um, as we went through this process, there was a, a lot of um, staff involvement and uh, they really helped out and then we had some sort of some transitions as Tom is here and then the building move and everything else like that. So the process went a little bit longer than we anticipated. Um, as we got through this, uh, really the objectives of the study was really what, what is the cost of service and what is the city's cost recovery level? Um, what should the city's desired cost recovery target should be? Um, basically, the, since you're on hourly uh, charges, it's really we'd expect that you get 100%, um, although that's not exactly what we found. When we talk about cost recovery, we're also talking about um, is it feasible to set fees at the full cost when we're talking about fixed fees? Um, will increasing fees result in any compliance or public safety issues? As well as can the market absorb any fee increases? And then finally, if you do make some adjustments, do, do these fees impact maybe other city goals that you might have? And so those are just things to think about in terms of cost recovery. Um, based on what we did and the time that we spent, we then came out, well, what would the fixed fees be in terms of the full cost of service? And then lastly, how do these fees compare relative to other fees? And, and we picked uh, these four uh, different cities, Kirkland, Redmond, Kenmore, Woodenville, which are more of the local areas that you might actually um, have in terms of neighboring communities. And somebody could build in Kirkland, they could build in Redmond instead of building in Bothell. Uh, same with Kenmore and Woodenville. So we picked those as the other comparative um, cities. 
So let me just go over sort of our fee methodology. Um, our first step is really involving collecting all this data. And so one of the things we do is we usually involve the staff and we ask and hold interviews and we say, well, what are the fee services? And those are usually pretty easy to identify because you have a number of listed permits and those are the permits that we look at. On top of that, we also ask, what are some of the non-fee services? So oftentimes there are services that are listed, aren't listed on there, but they are part of the permitting process and maybe you don't charge for that. So we also ask, well, should there be a fee for that and let's see if we cost it out. Now, whether or not it gets passed forward, that's a different question, but at least we've identified perhaps what the, the cost might be for a new fee or a modified type fee. Uh, the other part and key part is really for fixed fees is to identify the time estimates. How long does it take somebody to process a permit and who's involved in processing those permits? Um, so we did a lot of work. First of all, we did sort of an overall level. We have sort of a macro kind of level which says, if you were a staff member, how did you spend your time in, in this case, it would have been 2013. How much time did you spend working on building type permits, current planning, and if you did other kinds of things, like if you were doing long range planning, how much time did you spend there? So we get a sort of sense that overall, this is how much time was being spent um, and effort on <clears throat> these types of fee services as well as non-fee services. We also look and held different sort of staff focus groups to identify, well, if we take this single permit, how long does it take you to do this? And we did run into, we had some time data, as, the, as you mentioned, Mike mentioned, there was some transition in terms of the timekeeping systems and some other things that we found out about how time is kept. But we try to get estimates of if this is a, say, a variance, well, how long does it take you to process the average variance? And we're really talking can we cover with this amount of time, say 80 to 90% of the permits, okay? Because there's always gonna be permits that maybe take longer for whatever reasons, they're more complicated. Maybe the, the applicant didn't have as much information as they should have, and so you're going back for corrections and things like that. So those are things that we worked with the staff and we held a number of different focus groups. And then there's just the rest of the budget part of the cost, the non-labor cost, you know, the facility cost, the utilities, um, any consultant type cost, uh, supplies, all those types of costs. Uh, we also try and work in to the, the equation as well as the labor cost and then any overhead cost. So once we get all this data, we put it together and we make what we call these cost layers. And we say, here are direct services, which is how much time did somebody actually spend um, looking at a permit, so that's what we consider direct. When we talk about indirect services, that could include training, it could include um, just general administration, but one of the major things that we find in a lot of these different types of um, development agencies is that there's a lot of time for what we'd call public information and customer service. So somebody walks into the permit center, they say, well, I'm thinking about doing this. What permits do I need? How do I need to do this? Or I'm thinking about changing and doing something for my land use permit. What do I need to do? And so there's a lot of time being spent in terms of customer service oftentimes as to here's what you need to do, here's the application, here's, what, here's the, the things you need to bring back. And, and that's part of the customer service um, process. Uh, the last parts are we have department overhead, so we have, you know, the department director, we also have the managers and some of their administrative time just supervising all the people and we allocate those costs. And then the last one in certain, in certain cases, um, I don't think we had it for here, but um, in some cases where there's separate funds, we also have a city overhead cost, which is all the personnel costs, the, the um, finance costs, a lot of those kinds of costs that are added on top of the Thing. So we build these cost layers. And then finally, what we do then is figure out, based on hourly wages, who's working on it, what type of planner might be working on it, um, what the cost of an individual permit is. And in the report that uh, I think you have a draft at least, um, you'll see that we have a number of different types of permits and estimated how much, it would, how much time it would take and also how much it would cost. And that could include the cost of a planner, and it could include the cost of a, one of the permit techs spending time in putting the, the data and the permit into the systems and different inspectors doing different reviews. So, and so once we have that, we've got most of the, the information to say, here's what it costs to, um, to provide those services. 
And so the next part is really mostly policy. You know, how much do you want to recover? And based on our, the way we can do it, we can either do it at a program level, you could do it in a fee category, you could do it just on an individual fee basis, or some other cost category. You could take, say, well, we don't need to recover the city overhead or the department overhead. So those are a number of different options. And then once you set that target cost recovery level, then we can say, okay, let's take a look at the permits and figure out what that fee would be. And so that's generally how we do the, the fixed fee permits. Um, with building, there's also a little bit more involved in that because they also get revenue, but it's not based on the amount of time it takes. They get it through what's called valuation, and then they calculate what the fee is based on the valuation. So it's a little bit different in terms of the different fees. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through some of these. This is sort of the, I, the idea of a cost layer. Um, and so you can see that we have what we call the sort of direct services for building and sort of these indirect services and then sort of the overheads that we've added on to that. Um, and, and again, in this case, there was probably what, what we would say at least 53% of the cost is just providing that direct service. Another 22, 21 is for those indirect support services and then another 26 is for the department overhead. So what does that look like when we say, okay, here are the cost layers, here are the total revenues. And a couple notes about this. So what this says is at least in terms of all the building services that were provided, they took in more revenue necessarily than what it cost to do that. But in terms of building permits, what happens is somebody prepays the amount of their fee, and so all the work might ha actually happen if somebody comes in for a large commercial building, they, they pay the permit fees December 31st, it might get booked or shown as, as revenue, but all the work is gonna happen the next year or several years after that. So, so that's one thing that we, um, we didn't look at exactly, we didn't identify in other cases, we would identify what was the sort of the unearned income or what was the carryover uh, value of those permits. Um, also, it's, it is sort of a reflection of the economic activity, and in many of the cities that we do these building permits between 2013, 2014, and even this year, what we're seeing is at least building departments are ramping up because they've got much more money, there's much more building activity. And so one of the things that we also can't tell you right now is as part of this goes on in some of the places that we've done work, when they made, when the recession hit, they made a lot of cuts in the building department because it just wasn't, the activity wasn't coming in, but they hadn't hired back as much. And so sometimes those things are identified more in the performance metrics. So if you look at this and this was, really busy time, that might mean that an inspector takes a little bit longer to get out there. The plans need to be reviewed. They, they take a little bit longer to get, get to in some cases. So that's just an example of some of the things that could happen um, and have happened in some of our other jurisdictions and clients that, in terms of the building funds. Can I ask a question? Sure. So this is just a, a snapshot in 2013. Yes. We don't, we don't uh, typically have a 207% it's just that particular case. Yes. No, I, and, and <coughs> I, can, I can speak to that yeah. real quickly. The, I looked at a couple of, uh, you know, one, we had some big projects come in in 2013. I looked at the projects that came in in 2012 and 2013, uh, Six Oaks, uh, 104th Assemblage, two gateway buildings, a big University of Washington Science building. Uh, and if you look at the, the fees were paid in 2012 and 2013, and we didn't issue CFOs until 2014, 2015. So they're basically, if you will, they're reserving capacity for ins inspection staff to, to, to go out and do the inspections throughout the life of that project while it's being under construction. So it's not like the money comes in in 2013 and the work's done in 2015. And it's right. not like we're printing money. That's, that's we were just talking about that earlier. Yes, that, that, that's correct. correct. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Once we saw this increase, by the way, the staff, thank you very much. Once we saw this increase, staff was added as well because right. we saw what was coming um, once those permits came in. So there was, there's more going out now. Right, and so like, like I said, we did this in 2013 and we've had similar situations where, um, just mostly on the other, <laughs> other side of the mountains where we had another client that they there looked like this, but that year we were doing it in 2015, 2014, we did the thing in 20, the study in 2015 and in the end of 2015 they were actually hiring 
people because they had let go inspectors and plan reviewers until the activity started going up again. And so, so that's one of the things that there's sort of a lag there usually um, in terms of being able to, to finance and things. So if everything stopped today, but everybody that has a permit today kept on going and you did get any revenue, in theory you would still have revenue and you'd be obligated to, to still process and do the inspections for that particular thing. Can I have another thing? Thank you. <laughs> Nobody here. <laughs> oh. um, also, please keep in mind in your quarterly reports to the council and to the public that go on the website from the finance department, um, there is also, there was always a net figure for um, uh, development review and for permitting, so you know exactly where we are every single quarter. So you can see if there's a net positive or a net negative, and you can see it over the year and over the biennium. And so, um, and most of this revenue for the building is based on those valuation um, formulas. And so it doesn't really relate to exactly, whereas a fixed fee, we can say, oh, it took this much amount of time, and this is how much it cost us to do that. With the, the way that the traditional and most building departments work, they have these valuation tables, and then they have these, the fee schedules that they apply to those valuations. We had a question. Sure. You said you added staff. Sorry, you didn't. We added staff? We did. I think we added one inspector? We added an, one inspector, one plans examiner, and a part time permit. Too. And some admin, I believe, too. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not sure. Just keep it. I'm curious to see what this looks like every year, maybe for the last 10 years, right? Because one year snapshot doesn't give us the whole story. I'm curious to know if we're 100%, 207% over each year or not. Yeah, tip, typically, uh, Tammy can probably sp speak to that better, but typically uh, prior to the uh, recession, we seem to be running pretty much even, mm -hmm. right? And then so then we had the spike coming out of the recession and the downtown taking off. And yeah, it's normally a deficit. There's normally a deficit over a long period of time, yeah, um, which is not really completely a bad thing um, because those are restricted monies and they have to be spent on that purpose and they're very hard to track. So that's why we track them in the accounting department to make sure that if we ever do see a positive that's not going to be spent like this one where the next two years that's going to fund staffing, um, we need to make sure that those monies go back into another account and so on. So anyway, we watch it pretty close. We need another plans here, here. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and like I said, there are a number of different jurisdictions, uh, cities that are, and counties that are exactly, have faced that issue. Once that recession hit and they started laying off people, the economic activity kicked in a lot quicker than, than they could actually hire staff. And, and everybody's being conservative too. They don't want to hire staff and then have to lay them off again. So there's a little bit of that lag. So um, in terms of the bu building fee issues, um, uh, there are a couple, couple things, things that we talked about, about and one, one would be changing uh, the, plumbing the plumbing and mechanical fees, partly maybe making, making some uh, for same new single, single family residential building, building permits, permits maybe for plumbing and mechanical, have a fixed fee for both new as well as addition and alteration. So rather than <coughs> doing accounting fixtures, there's just a set fee and says if you're gonna do it, a new single family home, you're going to pay this for the plumbing and this for the mechanic. Um, also, um, fees are, might also be moved to for commercial properties on the plumbing and mechanicals, maybe do something based on the valuation um, and build something similar to the way that other building permits are done in Hamilton. There are a couple of uh, other cities that do it that way. Um, Kirkland happens to be able to really take plumbing and mechanical valuations and they apply a fee schedule just like they do for the building permits. And then lastly, there were some potential adjustments to some of the fixed fees that we identified in terms of the cost of the service. And so we've already answered and talked a little bit about this. Does 2013 still represent the development activity occurring today and in the future? So I think um, uh, that question has already been discussed a little bit. If you need more information, I'm sure um, I can tell you things are probably going on probably know that in your community what's being developed and what's not so compared to what it used to be. A um, couple things on the comparisons, the mechanical base fee um, is on the lower end of the spectrum with only one city being less expensive. 
um, of the remaining seven mechanical fees that we were able to compare. Um, Bobble was the most expensive for the four of them, and two Bobble's fees were in the middle, and one was you know, less than any other company in the city. Um, on plumbing, same thing, base fee was a little bit low. Um, all the plumbing fixture fees are the same or lower compared to the other jurisdictions. Current planning, um, this is a little bit different. Um, you can see the, the cost layers are a little bit different. Um, you can see that they spend a lot of time in terms of that public information and customer service area. Um, and the actual direct service time was only relatively, but roughly about a third um, compared to where it was about 40 something percent, I think, for the building area. Um, in terms of cost recovery, uh, cost recovery was about 50 percent. And actually, uh, that's pretty good for a planning um, organization. I can tell you recently we've done about seven different um, cities, and of those, only two were over 25 percent, and one was as high as 87 percent, but it was in a separate fund. and they were told that they had to be self-sufficient, so their fees were much higher in that, in that sense. Um, whereas the other five, and it just happens that those two happen to be in Oregon. And the ones that are in Washington that we're, we're doing now, which uh, um, are all averaging about 19%, between 16 and 23% were the, the average. So actually it's pretty good in terms of normally what we see as planning. Now, whether or not that's the right number, you can see that at least you're covering your direct costs um, and some of the indirect costs. Um, a couple of different things. One of the things is uh, continue either with the hourly or transition to some fixed fees or use a combination uh, where appropriate. And one of the thoughts would be is where there's lots of variance in terms of the time it takes or the, the complexity of a permit, that sometimes it's not easy to say well, this is the fixed fee because there's too much variation. So um, for some of those, you might decide to say, we'll have a fixed fee because we know what you think the base cost is, but after that, we're not really too sure, so we might be charging hourly. For some that are fairly, fairly straightforward, you might say, okay, we know exactly, we do tons of these types of permits, and it takes us exactly this amount of time, and we can do a fixed fee for that. Um, we tried to look at some of the past charges, and because of the time data and uh, some of the timekeeping issues, we, we sort of had on these particular four, just to give you an idea, we've sort of uh, found that the average fee for like a boundary line adjustment type one was about $630, but when we actually talked to people and the staff, they said, well, it takes us about this amount of time, and that came out to be about $800. Um, on some of the larger ones, like a conditional use type three, you can see it's really about 60% on a SEPA. Um, what they call SEPA SEPA was really about you know, $600, $700, but it cost about $1,200. And on the shoreline substantial development type permit, you know, it cost about $1,700, but it really costs about $9,000 to process and take care of. So those are just some of the examples. Again, um, uh, as part of the next step, we'll discuss how maybe some of these kinds of decisions will be made. Um, and of the planning's cost of service fees, we type the full cost of service on at least 21 that we could really compare. 12 are the highest compared to the other cities. Five are in the middle, four were in the lowest, lower categories. But the one thing we don't know about the other cities is we don't know what their cost recovery level policy was. And so they may be subsidizing it, they may be doing other things. But we just compared at least what the full cost of service would be. So whether or not you want to be in the middle or how, how that how that plays out, that's again a, a policy question. Any questions on planning permits? Okay. Um, engineering, we, we worked with that. One of the things just to note about this um, was that the engineers seemed to be very busy because they said they didn't really have much admin time. Um, so I think there's a page in the report where we talk about that's one reason why their hourly rate seems a little bit lower than what we would have anticipated or what's being uh, what was calculated uh, for 2013. Um, they're doing pretty well, as you can see, they're more like at 117% um, percent cost recovery. Again, it doesn't include the citywide overhead, so if you added some of that to it, it would probably be pretty, pretty close to being break even. 
what were some of the issues in terms of the engineering? Well, again, for, for fixed fees, we had to really, we worked a, with a lot of the staff on a number of different meetings trying to figure out what would be new fee, new fee categories because it was relatively easy for them to work on a project and charge time, but it might have been the same permit, uh, you know, because we had to break it down. Was it grading? Was it was it clearing? Was it, you know, something else, a utility permit? Um, in the end, the whoever the developer was or the applicant, they were still paying the, the same amount. So one of the things that we had to try and get a little better handle on was how to do the timekeeping and try and make some estimates. And again, we worked with uh, Don's staff to try and come up with some of these other categories. Um, and again, when we started looking at uh, other jurisdictions, the, the full cost of service, again, those fees generally appeared more expensive than other cities, but again, in the public works area, it's really hard, and, and the way your permit categories work, it's very hard to make comparisons in terms of some of those um, types of engineering type permits. And so, um, we did the best we could, but uh, it's very difficult to figure that out. But as you can see, the engineering permits are, are looks like they pay for themselves. The last one we did was fire. Um, these percentages aren't really right, correct? Uh, the part of the draft we were going to need to correct those. So, um, but again, a lot of their time is spent direct service, almost half, and um, the percentages really should be uh, a little bit different. They ought, actually ought to be 46 direct, um, 30 indirect, and 24 um, overhead. Um, when we took a look at their fees, they're pretty close to cost recovery. Now, one of the things that they have, because um, they do and participate in plan reviews, well, they charge a separate fee for that, and so over half this revenue is related to not a fixed fee, but a charge on a per square foot basis um, that they charge for reviewing plans. And so half the fees were there. So the other half is really related to the different kinds of sprinkler alarms, those kinds of different types of fixed fees. Um, but again, they're pretty close to be uh, recovering their costs. One of the key issues when we looked at that, um, we had roughly 10 fire fees that we could compare. And of the current fees that you have compared to the other jurisdictions, um, Bothell's fees were lowest for seven out of the 10. So, uh, and when you look in the report, uh, you can find that a lot of those fees for those fixed fees actually um, should be a lot higher. Um, and again, most of that revenue that they get is really coming from the plan review revenue. It's not coming from these individual fixed fees. So what are the next steps? Um, uh, we put something together, um, and maybe Tom um, might want to talk a little bit about it, but one, determine the fixed fees based on the whatever the city's council's target cost recovery level. Um, you may or may not be able to say, yes, we want to do X today, but maybe there's a range that you can provide and we give them some guidance. Once they have that guidance, then, then we can identify the fees that might be fixed and also those that might have hourly charges and try to peg that number to um, the, the target cost recovery level. Um, and then the next part would be, and again, this might be for the budget coming up, um, you know, identify revenue estimates for 2017 if you went to this new um, fixed fee uh, charging method. Um, as part of that, and looking at some of the, the processes and everything else, one of the things, too, we identified was there might be, need to be some clarification on changes. And for example, um, if they take in plans or something and there's continual um, correction cycles or continual missed inspections, and so you have to keep on going out there. Well, one of the things that we talked about was having that reinspection fee or that sort of corrections fee. So you're given maybe two or three chances to fix things, and then after that, we're going to start charging you for every other um, correction that you need to make. If it's not the city's fault, you know, they've given you all the guidance. And so one of the things that we would suggest is that. The, obviously, the director would have some discretion in determining whether or not that should be charged or not charged. But that would be um, one method of doing it. The other part, too, is just to make sure when permits applications are submitted that that they're complete and you do sort of a completeness review to make sure everything is, is put together before accepting a, uh, an application. And then finally, um, whatever changes come about um, or whatever the 
the new fees might be, then obviously the, those changes would be needed to be reviewed by, by yourselves and in terms of what, what might happen. And so I don't know whether that would be during the budget process or whether prior to that, so I don't know. So you know, say anything about this? It would probably be a little bit of both. Um, one of the things that's uh, uh, in, in permit tracking software is going to take a considerable amount of data updates to put different fee tables and, and uh, rates in for all the different various permit types we have. So our IT folks have already told us they're going to need an extensive amount of time to, to accomplish that. Once the once that's the strategy has been decided and the fees have been set, then they're going to take some time to have to look for us for the next implement. So, have they given so, you an idea of how much time? Uh, you know, probably a couple, three months. Joe, Joe's happens to be, and Mr. Sherman's in the audience, he might be able to answer that question. Uh, it depends on the depth of the changes. So, if the recommendations is a minimal amount of flat fees per implemented, uh, I think the report talked about basically almost like 27 of them. We looked at about 80 hours of staff time. But if you start really going down the rabbit hole of changing a lot of fees and then also keeping the evaluation fee as a <clears throat> add-on, uh, it really starts changing the whole data process. And we might actually extensively have to go back and start the system from scratch to <clears throat> redo the new flow. Because the flow of the workflow and the data structure was built on the previous system. So matters how much changes are made. So uh, that's something to keep in mind is if we go too extensive, it could really start adding that. So uh, we're open for open for questions. That's sort of our, our presentation. And just so you know that the, the wireless mics are not needed. They were really needed just for the audience, and we just have staff. And so this mic is back on now. Okay. So if you can hear each other, then BCTV can hear you as well. So a couple of questions. If we were to set a policy that we want 100% cost recovery for direct, indirect overhead costs, is that going to impact what IT is going to need to do to update the system? Yes, yes and no. It's really going to be good methodology in how we get the, uh, when, we went, when we went back years ago to when we transitioned from flat fees to development review billing hours. Uh, the, the council's at times direction to staff was they wanted us to recover 100% of the costs of development, recognizing that, as Peter talked about, that you know planners and building plans examiners and others spend time at the counter helping customers and answering questions. Obviously, they can't bill for those for those hours, but the time was actually spent working on projects. They wanted it to be 100% self self uh, recovery. So it's it's really a matter of what the direction of the council is that they want 100%, 90%, 80%. Or, or whatever that number is, and then how we get there, the methodology we get there, is, as Joe spoke to, there's a lot of fees, a lot of permit types right now that we don't have any fees in them, we just, we just build. And then there are like building fees that we, it's all based on valuation, and building fees is based on a per appliance or per fixture that we can So it depends on how wholesale the changes are and, and what the direction from the council to us to accomplish is. Uh, the, the other thing too is it's probably on the building side. It should there are already fixed fees already from the can of plumbing. There's already valuation part, and that's probably most of the, the way the fee revenue comes in. On planning and engineering, there are a lot of different types of fee categories that have to be um, updated. But the real key to this is you have to look at where the volume is because it makes sense to have full cost recovery on those that are gets you a lot of volume if you have a fee only once a year or a permit that only comes in once a year no matter how you might just keep that as a an hourly in the time in the air um, but those that are that come in regularly and you can really identify how much that is and you have lots of them that's where you're going to get the larger revenue gain. Um, changing a fee you know a fee even if you double the fee for a permit that you only get once a year you know it's not really going to have much of a revenue impact so it's, those are the things too that we need to look at. We do have some volumes. Um, it's just a matter of double checking that. See, is that the right feed to raise? And what's the correct amount? And then is the 
upper limit on the fees that we charge really based on how competitive we want to be with our neighboring jurisdictions? There's no legal limit. So like there is with traffic impact fees. We can't just charge as much as we want for traffic impact fees. It has to be related to a specific program. Are we limited in that way with charging? For all fees, yes you are, especially building fees. Um, there have been a number of um, suit lawsuits um, that have gone either way. Um, that say, and the RCF is very specific about that the fees need to cover only the cost. Now, what they consider as part of cost, that's still not real clear sometimes. Um, so, but in general, anytime you have a user fee, it's the fee is supposed to just cover the cost of the cost of doing it. So we would, as a policy, set cost recovery at say 110 percent to bank for some deficiency in the future. We could, we can only, we can only set a policy to cost recovery at 100 percent. We just need to decide what those costs are. What well, we want to cover, whether it's direct, indirect, overhead. That would be the base fee. In other places, um, they have surcharges. So, like, you have a technology surcharge. So, that money is being banked to help pay for new technology. In other places, they have, well, once they decide and determine how much is the prepaid liability, there's also, if they have a, a different way of doing the, the things, then they also, they might have like a, a core staffing. Uh, reserve. So if there is a downturn, you'd be able to support staff for a little bit longer. You know, obviously, if you were in recession a few years ago, you still wouldn't make cuts, but sort of the temporary kinds of ups and downs, there's, there's you know, that, that's another kind of surcharge that's been used by other jurisdictions. Um, well, I'll just say, say that um, I'm in support of 100% cost recovery um, because we just had discussions about how expensive personnel are and wouldn't we want to cover the costs of our personnel's time through um, a fee system so um, and I think when we talk about what our costs are I think an indirect cost like you, you described speaking with somebody at the counter about what steps they need to do to take for, to a permit is is just as important as running through the checklist of a permit that comes in. I mean, that's still a cost uh, of development. So that's why I, I like the idea of having cost recovery of the indirect costs as well. Um, and if we can do overhead costs without um, without being so out of line with our neighboring jurisdictions, I think I think that that, that is a goal. Now, can you? We kind of ask where you know, do we want to do you know, fee based or evaluation based, and for me that kind of is just getting into the means of things. Sure. Yeah, um, and all, all I all I'm thinking is, you know, make the changes that are going to get us to the full cost recovery, minimize the impact on IT time, um, focus on the high volume issues. And if the easy, if the if the low volume issues are easy enough to tweak, like for example, shoreline development, we're we're recovering 18% of the cost of that. I don't imagine we probably do a lot of short shoreline development um, uh, permits, but if it's easy enough to change that, then that seems to be you know a win-win situation. So um, I guess does that does that make sense? That. I mean, I know that you live and breathe these bees, and for me, I get a little lost in that. In bills? Yeah. What is our the, our surcharge? It's 5%. 5% of the total bill? 5% of the total bill. $250,000 total intake then? Yes. Yeah, for that, for that year, that's what it was And how many people staff uh, just uh, community development for overseeing our for my, program? For IT support. Yeah, IT support, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Well, there, it's actually it's your mark for two things. One, a portion of it goes to the ECD Go for our, our, our alliance membership. Uh, as a, what are we now? Partners, we are subscribers. Subscribers. Thank you uh, for the MVP portal, and then the remainder of it uh, is to to pay for Joe's uh, work to, to support the technology. So, computer, software, mobile, mobile devices, etc. Did you look at, are we 100% on that? For we didn't um, look at that. Yeah. In, in some places where they haven't had a, a surcharge like that, we've done an act. You know, yeah. Some of them, like you get a new permit system, you know, if it costs a couple hundred thousand, you know, maybe you want to get, over five years you're going to replace it, then you, know, you want to try and collect yeah. you know, a, a certain amount every year. And then calculate what you think your estimated revenues would be and come up with a percentage. That's why it's a, sur a surcharge, at least you can raise up or down depending yeah. on what you anticipate is going to happen. Yeah. I think that's a very important charge that we're including that we should consider reassessing. Um, I am 100% in favor of like a lump sum fee as in many cases as possible because that gives certainty to the investment community um, that's coming in here to understand that they're not just going to be charged and charged. I'm sure, Mike, that you look at those bills and you smile as you send them to me in the mail. Just kidding. Um, we have an amazing staff here at Bothell, but it would be nice to have a full understanding. Like with Salamish County, you go up there and you know you're going to apply for a house. It's like a five thousand dollar fee or whatever. It's, it's a lump sum fee. So if the city is able, their county is able to get through that review, good for them. But if it takes a little bit longer, which it sometimes does, it does. But hopefully, we net out a hundred percent at the end of the year. So hopefully, we can move forward with the lump sum fee as many cases as possible, rather than an hourly look at. So there's certainty on. Both sides, really. But let's really make sure that we're charging an appropriate technology fee. Yes. Because if we can be um, far more digital in the field, um, the plans exam, not plans examiner, but the, your building inspectors go out and they have a, one of those iPad Pros or whatever these things are surface at hand to be able to look at the plans. Or I know they're supposed to be provided on site, but it's nice for them to be able to walk through the building and be able to scan through and see exactly if we can equip them. It just helps them to be able to do their job a little bit more in that tech meet fee. In the end, uh, investors who are building buildings or small ADUs are going to benefit. Right. And just to be clear, the tech fee is not just earmarked for the building fees. That's, that's earmarked for all the development review fees. So all the hourly bills for planning, engineering staff, uh, those, are, those, those are also going to five percent different costs. Okay. That's all it comes. Can I ask, is that I assume, but maybe I'm wrong, that there's some sort of efficiency in that one to There's, yes, there's a, there's a huge gain in uh, the community development admin folks. Uh, there's, there's two things that we're working on right now. One is uh, online inspections capabilities. Right now we have an admin person spending about three hours a day scheduling inspections. <coughs> Taking off the recorder, creating the report, copying the report, emailing the report. Uh, and the other is the amount of time on the uh, first of the month that they spend going through all of the uh, hours from all the staff, the builder hours, and creating invoices, mailing out invoices, and tracking them. So there's, those are huge, uh, huge time gains for staff. So I would agree with both of the other council members' comments. Uh, I don't know if it's how easy it would be. Be to get to 100%, and certainly they were getting as close as we can, but it worked with sense. And um, see, but yeah, we lose the difference of $6,000. Can you say that $9,000 for $9,000? Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. So, I mean, we're obviously where those things make sense. Um, I don't know how to weigh when Joe says rebuilding the system versus that 100% of the company. So. I'd like to be able to recover as well. Yes. Try to get as close to recovery as we can. Try to be as comparable to some of the other cities so we don't do not be most expensive so people will go elsewhere. Just to clarify, when Council's talking about close to recovery, you're talking about indirect, direct, as well as overhead. 
Yeah. Um, I would agree with uh, Councilman Ragnu that and others that while being in the middle and competitive, this recovers as much of our costs as we can. Um, and then I did have a, a question uh, on re you know, plans are submitted, there's markups right. and then corrections. Um, that would be, you know, you give them one or two to fix the markups that were generated the first time. But if there's other markups that come later, those get a separate one or two, correct? Well, that's uh, where the sort of the discretion comes in. If it's a new markup that somebody didn't catch the first time, I would think you'd allow them to another yeah. opportunity to fix that. I think that's what Peter was implying when he said it's not the city's fault, and we've given them every you know, third direction we can, and they continue to come out with all the directions that we're giving them. Yeah, I, I fix everything right. you tell me, and then all of a sudden they come back with new markups. Like, well, right. gosh dang, why weren't these done the first time? So, okay, and then do you do you find that having a fixed fee? Anecdotally, things process quicker? Well, I think we just talked about that. If you don't have a fixed fee and somebody's got to record their time and you've got loaded hourly rates and all this other stuff that you've got to take into consideration, somebody's, and somebody's got to bill it, somebody's got to receive it, um, you know, overall that cost is a lot more work. In, in general, if they have no other fixed fee, they walk in, they hand you the check, and you're, you're it's just counted as cash and it goes to the bank, you know. Um, and if but reason, from, from the review standpoint, do you, do you find that you know, the actual reviews are getting done quicker? I don't know that they're getting quicker. We haven't ever um, looked at that. We usually look at what it costs to do that. And in some cases, um, many building departments and other places have gone through this lean process to look at the processes and identify where, you know, things can be done a little bit more efficiently or some reviews may be done simultaneously or things like that or concurrently. So, um, but we didn't, we didn't look at that in this particular. And, and certainly there, there are efficiencies to be gained. I mean, I can, I can certainly talk to the, to the building planner teams that have spent, you know, we look at a large commercial structure and, and they can spend uh, the better part of an hour or two trying to figure out how many plumbing fixtures are going in and how many appliances are going in and counting them up and looking at the fee table and figuring out what the fees are owed. Versus just saying it's you know it's two percent of the overall project you pay for plumbing, mechanical, and AP permits, and they're done with it. They're no longer doing accounting stuff. They're focusing on the actual technical planner deals and getting things off the desk after. So certainly in that manner, there would be efficiencies gained by going to an easier flat. Right, and that, that's one reason why, at least in some cases, for like the new residential, the single-family residential, on the plumbing and mechanical permits was to do it based on either having just a, a fixed fee for that, because in general, you know, there's a certain house, a new house is going to have so many bathrooms, you know, and so many, you know, sinks and things that the, the marginal difference between whether it's three fixtures or four fixtures wasn't going to make a big difference. So um, the staff felt that maybe they could just say, okay, here's the number of inspections. And actually, we actually went and identified the number of inspections per per type of uh, uh, structure. So, so we have a, a good sense of how many actual average inspections it takes to do certain Okay, thank you. Me, I'm last. Well, I haven't done yet, but you'll be done. I can go. No, I'll go. I'll, I'll go. Um, so I'm definitely in support of 100%. Um, and at the same time, I, I think the fixed fee in dealing with different municipalities on a uh, level, the day to day level, myself personally, um, those fixed fees processes do streamline make it much, much easier, especially for. Uh, the person who's going to apply for those fees and understanding what they're going to need. Um, and I think for city staff, I've seen in other municipalities what helps that as well. Um, I, you know, I agree with the, the previous comments about um, the processes in the field um, and making sure that the, the inspectors that are in the field have the tools to make their job much easier. Um, and having that access, my building permit was a, a good step in the right direction. Um, and then having software internally that's going to allow us to streamline things very important as well. So um, I'm, I'm all for it as long as we're paying for it. Um, one of the things I didn't understand is, is Councilmember Sandberg asked a question about, about 100%. Um, and looking ahead, if we say 
do we really want to put a reserve in and maybe say we want 110 percent to make sure that we're covering anything that we're not seeing? Well, I think the goal is usually 100 percent, and some of those, um, like I said, the reserves you have, the tech reserves, and some other things like that. It's really sort of a, um, you know, part of it on the building side, it's a little bit easier, but you have economic ups and downs, and you've got different kinds of permits. So, again, part of it is really forecasting the budget process and the project process, what do you think your revenues are going to be, how many permits, especially on the planning side and on the engineering side. So that's really the key part as to whether or not, for example, in 2013, if we had X number of variance requests or X number of utility type permits, do we expect that to happen again in the next year? So that's where there's going to be some variation uh, as part of that. But I don't know that we can say, well, we should recover or I think that's really something that the uh, policy decision is maybe you guys need to look at a little bit closer. Yeah, because that snapshot show, showing 207 percent for that one specific period, but it was split out over 14, 15, and possibly even right. 16, doesn't really give us a true picture of where we are to say, yeah, we are at 100 percent. Right. So I think, you know, um, Amy's already said, you can you already have some of that information and that's being put out the monthly report to see where, where you are. And again, we took that snapshot. We didn't necessarily say, of this permit revenue, how much of it was, quote, carried over into the next year. It could be very well, especially given the size of the projects during 2013 um, that were happening, which you know, public parts of this building, parts of across the street there. All that development was happening. So there was a lot of permit revenue coming in. Um, we just didn't. Uh, and at the time, we didn't say, oh, of that $2 million, whatever, how much of that was carried over into 2014, you know, um, and then even some of it's carried over into 2015. So, uh, but that would be a process that you're going to be doing. You're already sort of doing that already. So it's just a matter of, at the end of the year, seeing where you are relative to, to those permits. So you know how much revenue you took in, and at the same time, you'll know sort of where you are in terms of what you sort of earn. And how to, do you have a snapshot of like a 10 yeah, it's, or something? It's in the quarterly report that's sent to the council. It's um, on the back page. Um, actually, you probably look at it electronically, but um, yeah, it's just there's a number. It says permitting and then development review, and it'll show a plus or minus figure for the year, year to date. <coughs> more than likely a comparison from the last year. And, uh, and that's a quarterly report? Uh -huh. And those reports are out there since mm -hmm. 90, or 2000 and something. So you can go back and look at each one. Yeah. Those, um, and I'll take this opportunity to remind everybody to please look at those reports. They're very interesting and important. <laughs> There's a lot of good information there. Really is. And you know, one of the things about this particular department is it's one of the few in the city that's really related to how the economy is going in terms of activity and how their revenue comes in. Um, so that's the other thing. You know, when development's happening really well, you know, you're going to see more revenues come in, perhaps, than staffing. You may uh, see how much you need to staff up or staff down. You know, it just depends on how the economy is going. Whereas most other services, in terms of like, just like you were saying, like fire, regardless of what the economy is, you're still going to have to go out and do the EMS calls and things like that. Whereas in, in this particular department, you're going to have ups and downs in terms of the revenue uh, that occur in the staffing that you go, go Well, that led me to another question. So, do we, does the city contract out? Um, services for review and things like that? We, we do. We have a consultant that's on, on uh, uh, contract right now. Uh, does the, in fact, he does all the big stuff. This firm does all the big stuff for us. The structure reviews, and then uh, when we get caught with this uh, current tidal wave, we start letting uh, all of our applicants to, to use those services for a fee to send those out to them as well. So, and that would be the same 100% recovery? Yes. But, but technically, uh, technically, we try to do the majority of that work in house and just send the large structural reviews out. Yeah, there are, there are some cities that have what they call expedited review. So if you think you want yours faster, you're willing, you're willing to pay extra overtime and everything else to, to get it, then that's the extra fee that you pay. So at least the city is not losing 
money to expedite your fee. If you if they have to pay overtime, your the applicant's going to foot the bill for all that extra just to get it quicker. And we have that process. We do not. We do not have that process. But some we can sort of discuss. Are we looking at that process? We we, we certainly can. The, the only the only reluctance I have toward it is what I've found in the past is uh, we budget for overtime that gets expended fairly quickly. Uh, staff gets burned out. It's awfully hard to tell somebody that's been already working overtime and you know they're willing to pay you to come in and work. So it, it comes down to how much is your staff willing to work five, six, seven uh, days extra a month versus uh, you know having a family and life. So that's that's part of the problem is how much how much overtime the staff want to work. But we have to uh, exactly could that be you know, contract balance for contract? Well, it could be. It could be certainly. So, because I've heard Council, our Deputy Mayor Doerr say that we have an issue with TIs and the, the time frame it takes to do TIs. We, we have in the past. We have absolutely have. We were, uh, we were doing well, uh, and then and we're doing well. And now, right now, today, uh, the guys are pulling plans in the drawer that were uh, had a due date of April 11th. So we are like one day behind our target today. Oh, really? so, oh, okay. so we've made we've made a mark in progress. Thank you, Lynn. We've stepped. I just had one other comment. And sometimes you pay expedited in the morning. So, you know, not necessarily. Not, not your She said it's not your A different, <laughs> different <laughs> municipality. But it does happen because if, if, you're, if you're giving it out or consulting it out, sometimes that wants control. I think we killed it. You got your direction you did? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, I um, can't come with you. Uh, <laughs> we're we're uh, over two hours beyond our budgeted time, and I have to relieve somebody very extra early tomorrow, so I'm going like, to bug out to get some rest. I think I should. Now, yeah, you could make an excuse to or a reason to the deputy mayor and bug out yourself also. <laughs> well, Don's pretty quick. And he's always lying on. Uh, yeah. Extending <laughs> <laughs> <Sanitary. laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> till 10 15. Raise your hand. Okay. Extending till 10 15. Don. So this is AB 16065, so it's session regarding reciprocal transportation communication with Snohomish County. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Don Payne, Utility Development Services Manager. And this is a study session regarding the proposed interlocal agreement with Snohomish County concerning the reciprocal transportation mitigation. A little background, um, prior to February of 2006, the City of Bothell did not have the authority to collect transportation mitigation and impact fees from developments that take place in the unincorporated uh, area of Snohomish County. And in uh, February of 2006, Council approved an interlocal local agreement with the county that expired at the end of last year. Um, a little background also, in 2015, the city collected over $800,000 in transportation mitigation fees from unincorporated Snohomish County developments. So the purpose of the ILA is for the city to have a legally defendable process for the authority to review all projects within the area as noted on attachment to the map uh, in your agenda packet. Um, the agreement is based on the principle that trips generated from the development projects outside the city limits will impact Bothell's transportation network and therefore these impacts need to be mitigated. The ILA also provides a similar process for projects that are proposed for developments within the city that affect the Snohomish County roadway system. The city staff worked with Snohomish County staff on the new ILA. There aren't any major changes compared to the previous ILA. ILA. This is the map, and you see if you go like a county project that's further out, the impact is a lesser percentage um, on the city streets, on the city, excuse me, on the city roads, and vice versa over here. The city 
area that's farther <laughs> away from the county, so less lesser percentage impact. Um, these these uh, percentages were worked out by the transportation experts uh, ten years ago when they created the ILA. Um, some questions were submitted from the council um, that we just got answers from. Uh, how much uh, revenue has the city received from county development since the ILA was instituted in 2006? And that answer is uh, $2.25 million. Um, almost a th over a third of that me, was received just last year. We had received eight, it was a banner year for development, obviously, in Bothell, and we received uh, $846,000, which that was uh, county developments, uh, actually, that incorporated county developments, a banner year for them, too. Uh, how much uh, money was spent on Snohomish County Road projects in 2015? This is money we used on um, capital projects. Um, not grant uh, grants, but the local money, and that was two hundred forty-six thousand. Um, how much revenue has this county received from city developments since the ILA was instituted? Quite a bit less than what we're getting on the other end. Only one hundred seventy-one thousand uh, dollars, and only thirteen thousand last year. Um, is there a possibility of a park mitigation fee ILA with other municipalities? And I did share this with John um, Keats. Um, the answer is perhaps, but there doesn't appear to be much of a precedent that uh, I, we, have, we can't find any other jurisdictions that are doing this kind of thing. And it would require a mutual agreement. Both parties have to agree to do this, just like Snohomish County and uh, Bothell are agreeing to do this ILA. Um, it would probably also be very difficult to estimate outside user impacts. Um, it's much easier with transportation. Um, and of course, it opens up the city development impacts on outside city limit parks. So if we did this, for instance, with Snohomish County, um, our city developments would have to uh, pay towards it as well, just as they do with the transportation ILA. Um, has there been any transportation safety mitigation compensation, as, as, as is referred to in the ILA? No, there hasn't been up to date, but it's, it's a provision in case uh, that kind of thing were to uh, be pertinent to a situation that uh, hasn't happened in the past. Um, that's all I have for my presentation. There's no action required tonight. Um, take council questions and comments. Um, and the ILA would come back for approval next week. Good. Any questions? Any difference in this ILA from the 2006 ILA? No, no nothing significant. Uh, they streamlined it some. Um, the worksheets were changed. There was some very minor stuff, but not, nothing significant as far as the way it would be calculated out. And so we seem to be getting. Um, a, an inflow of, of impact fees net over the outflow of impact fees. Significant, yeah, it's up over 10 times as much. And, and those, um, that map that you showed the percentages, mm -hmm. um, you said those percentages were determined by transportation planners 10 years ago? Yes, they, they, they feel it's still pertinent. They, they still, they, they don't, they still apply. And then, um, so on the question about um, we received what, about $800,000 in 2015, but we spent about 200, was it 246000 so they to keep that, keep track of that and make sure we're... So is the, is the plan then to um, use those, um, those impact fees from Snohomish County on um, more of Snohomish County road projects? Are there not... Um, capacity increasing projects in the Snohomish County area that we're not able to apply that money to? Well, the, it's a lot of these are big projects that take years to plan and years to, you know, so you can't do it in the same year that you collect. So that, that's you know, be part of the problem. And it's the same list. The traffic impact fee list is the same for this ILA as it is it's for, for our the, impact, for our impact fee. Right? So. Any questions? 
Yeah. So there was a there was eight hundred and forty six thousand. Um, what was the total we spent two hundred forty six thousand in Spanish County? Yeah, this past the end of in two thousand fifteen. Right. So there was six hundred thousand more than that. Well, we keep track of it, um, it and and our impact fees to even go to any project throughout the throughout the city actually. So we have a we, we have a citywide uh, area that's of influence as far as the impact fees. They don't have to go to it. Like if you have a development in a certain area of Bothell, you go to any area. Your impact fees can go to any of the major uh, capacity projects throughout the city. Okay, so we're we're getting this from Snohomish County, and we're spending it throughout Bothell. Yeah, we do. We keep track of the we keep track of it though to make sure it's being spent uh, appropriately. I mean, I could get more detail on it if you want. I could bring that next week. Yeah, but I would definitely like to see that. Um, and then, how does that the six hundred thousand? How can that affect? Or how does that help us when we're talking about streets and sidewalks? And well, these are only for capacity projects, so projects that are affected by growth, um, that have, they're only allowed to fund those site projects. They're not allowed to fund like overlays or prop, the maintenance and operations and that kind of thing that we were talking about earlier in time. But like you could fund like capacity um, improvements on 228. 228, that's what I was thinking. We have been doing projects up in Snohomish County area, but they've been largely grant funded. So, like the Bothell Everett Highway widening was largely grant funded. The 228th Bothell Everett Highway intersection improvements we're doing now largely grant funded. So, a lot of the projects that we have currently on our list. Yeah, that 246,000 was for a project that cost that the actual cost of the whole project was something like 1.2 million, and it was only 246,000 in local fees, and the rest of it was all grants. The CFP also allocates these monies, and so it's it's very clear where they're being spent and how uh, they're being used, and the projects that they're allowed to be used for. So, and some of it's for debt service, and some of it is to um, basically match grants. So we basically leverage it as best we can to get the most out of it. I just I think it would be good to understand as a whole where we bring money in and where we put money in. And I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm saying I'm asking these questions because I don't quite understand yet. Um, and for me, when I talk to people in the community, I would say, oh, yeah, we get $800,000 from Snohomish County. Um, and the first question that's going to probably come to us is, do you spend that in Snohomish County? So it's good for us to understand here kind of how this money can be spent, where it's being spent. It's, it's, it, the, two, the money they're spending, though, is for their impacts on our roads. Mm -hmm. So that's throughout the city, our city. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't have to be, it, it's not at all really for Snohomish County roads, it's for road, roads in Bothell. Mm -hmm. the, the, the trips are coming from Snohomish County and coming into Bothell. Mm -hmm. Don, is there, to see that that's part of the committee. Okay. Don, is there an opportunity to move that Bear Creek line over to Highway 9? Because <laughs> the... Uh, uh, I know. That you're, yeah. Um, because that's where the majority of the Summers County development is going to be taking place in the next 10 years. It's between that Bear Creek line and Highway 9. There is. That's where the new high school is. That's where the Jewel subdivision is and all the development that's uh, designated on the east side of that road. So you want to make that county area 30% size bigger? Yes, I over like to Highway 9. Okay. Can we do that? Can we... Uh, that's, that's the only easy. change. I guess it's possible, but uh, oh. we actually just, it took, it took several months to get this <laughs> to where we're at. But uh, I, 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 I don't know if the county would have to be, I mean, it, it, this is a mutual <laughs> They don't know who they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. It's utility land. They would know it. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. 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 All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council committee reports.
Executive session. All right. Move. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand. Aye. 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 Aye.